All right. Looks like, well, this is, I'm getting started earlier than usual, so God probably knew I had a lot of slides today. So he's just like, okay, let's get started. So we are in angelology, and we are in part five of my five-part site, or part, five-part series. Oh, I'm fumbling up here. Five-part series. Uh, I did intro to angelology, then we did the holy angelic beings, the angel of the Lord, and then last week I did Satan. And today we will be doing the satanic angelic beings, but we do have all these up on YouTube and Substack if you need to go back and review any of these or you missed any of those. So that's where we are at. And what is angelology? I have my uh, simple uh, definition up here. Study of the beings of the spirit world, uh, most commonly referred to as angels. And what we're learning about is what the Bible actually says about these beings and not what Hollywood has said. We've been talking about that for a while, the different portrayals, especially Satan last week we talked about where he doesn't have red horns and stuff. I said it probably comes from the red dragon in Revelation 12, and that's really inaccurate uh, to portray him that way based on what the Bible says. And we've been learning more and more about that. And then, of course, why study angelology? Why even take the time to do this? I've been talking about how the spirit world is often neglected because we live so far removed from biblical times and we just sometimes don't take it seriously. Um, the spiritual warfare in Ephesians 6 says that we should. And today we're going to finally talk about some of the interesting phenomena that I think we can explain biblically if you understand what the Bible says about the spirits in the spirit realm. All right, so angel is both a title and a general term. I've been talking about that, how angels are considered all the spiritual beings. That's why even today's concept of the satanic angelic beings, people think it sounds like an oxymoron. How can they be satanic and angelic? Because angelic has nothing to do with being good or bad. Satanic means against the gospel, right? Against God. So angel is a general term. You're going to find out demon is a general term as well. Every bad spirit you've ever heard of has been called a demon, but they're not all demons, and that's what we're going to learn about today. So we're going to continue to learn about the generalization and then the actual details of these spirits and their different abilities, just like the angels. Remember, we had the seraphim and the cherubim. They are different than angels. Angels are messengers. Cherubim kind of guard the throne. We're going to see the demons have something, a demon a spirit, I should say, because there's demons and angels and all kinds of stuff we're going to learn about here. So... Most people, when you ask them, and if you would have came last week, you actually would have probably said something like this too, which is right. Uh, when you ask people about, you know, the evil, they'll consider it Satan and the demons. Like I said, the general term there, the demons. And they'll say something like this. Lucifer was a fallen angel cast out from heaven for rebelling against God. And because of this, he led a rebellion with other fallen angels, right? And that is true, but only partially true. And there's so much more to the story that we usually don't talk about. And that's what we're going to be here to talk about today. Because we even learned last week that Lucifer is actually not a fallen angel, he's a fallen cherub, but he's a fallen angel in the general sense, right? So we're going to get, again, jump into this. So, Satan is the leader of the satanic angelic beings, uh, but remember that all these satanic angelic beings we're going to talk about are rebels against God. So if they rebel against God, it's hard for me to believe they always listen to Satan. So I think, I'm sure Satan has his own issues at times, uh, but when I say he's the leader, he's the head of it, he's trying to mock Yahweh, the Father, right? So that's what Satan tries to do. He's trying to be like God still today. And this includes the gods, the fallen angels, and the demons. Those are the three ones we're going to be focusing on today. Um, but here's the scripture. We won't read them right now because we have a lot of slides to go through. We'll read some scripture. Uh, but if you remember in Matthew 12, 24, Satan's called the prince of demons. Some translations, the ruler of demons. Uh, Jesus himself, Matthew 25, 41, refers to the devil and his angels. So he kind of even groups them there under his authority. And then Revelation 12, uh, we know that Michael and his angels fight against the dragon, which is symbolized by Satan, and his angels. So remember that Satan is the leader of the beings we're about to talk about. He has a higher rank because Satan was the highest ranking being, we believe, uh, next to God. Uh, you know, and obviously not even close to God, but that's what got to his head, right? Uh, but he's over these beings. But again, I'm not saying that they fall lockstep like the good angels, like the holy angels do with Yahweh. I don't think they fall lockstep like those ones do, and there's probably some turmoil every so often. All right, now to understand this, we have to go to the weird stuff again. For those of you who didn't watch, you got to go back uh, on YouTube. I have the ancient biblical worldview, and you have to understand that to understand what I'm talking about today. So we're going to go through it. If you weren't here for that one, this is going to sound strange, um, but I'm telling you, this is what was believed. So basically, we're going to go to the origin story of what they thought in biblical times, not what they think today and but what the Bible actually, the people back then actually believed the spiritual war to be that the Bible is talking about. So the first rebellion, I don't have to go too deep into this. We all know this. This is the answer that most people give. Why is there a spiritual war going on? And they'll talk about the garden. And that is true. 
Uh, this was a human and a divine rebellion in the garden. Of course, we know this is a simple one. Adam and Eve, right? Eve eats the fruit, and so does Adam then, was deceived by the snake. So it was a, it was a human and divine rebellion. Uh, the humans, obviously, was Adam and Eve going against what God said, being deceived by the serpent, Satan, and Satan went against him. This is where many believe he actually got expelled from the divine council. So you see in Job, Satan showed up at the divine council, but he was not there in the court ruling or helping God make decisions. So he'd been, he'd been kicked out of the divine council, and so have these other gods, these other beings. Because remember, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, God has a divine council, although he doesn't need their help. He, he asks their help, and he allows them to make decisions with him, and they are no longer in it. So that was the first of three rebellions, right? So you guys are pretty familiar with that concept. And this is where the, the spiritual war really begins, okay? This is where it begins. Now you have good versus evil, right? And essentially, this would be the origin story of all that. Some people are going to debate and say, well, Satan fell first. Some people get into the gap theory and say, Satan fell, had a war, then God redid it all, and then it happened again. Possibly, I don't know, but the pattern this follows shows that it's potentially Satan fell at this moment. It was all happening in the background. We don't know uh, per se, but it falls along with these rebellions. So we know that was the first one, Satan, Adam, and Eve, right? And now here's the second one. Uh, some of you are familiar with it, but this is where it starts to get really strange. Most people don't know. Genesis 6 Verses 1 through 4 was the second of the three rebellions. So it takes on a new level, and you're going to see things in this story. We're going to slow down a little bit and elaborate on it. That will make sense maybe of other passages in the Bible for you. So this divine rebellion is different than the first one. This one was uh, divine with human corruption included. So it was led by divine beings, and which is kind of like the first one. Satan talked Adam and Eve into this, right? Talked Eve into it, um, and they took part in that. But this time, it's the spirit. So the fallen angels, also referred to as the watchers. I think Daniel even calls them the watchers. Um, these were beings that were apparently supposed to be watching over the earth, making sure it's good. You see terminology like this throughout the Bible. And they're the ones that thought the women were beautiful. They're called sons of God here. They thought the women were beautiful. But let's go ahead and just read uh, the scripture. I put it on up, up on the screen here. Uh, Genesis 6, 1 through 4. When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they choose. So right there, that was the sons of God, these spirit beings, the watchers, taking on the women. And then look at the other yellow verse down here I highlighted here. The Nephilim, that's their children, were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them. Now, like I said before, some people are going to, you're going to read some commentaries that are going to be incorrect about this, and they're going to tell you, oh, this is sons of Seth, and this is because Cain is the son of the devil, and, you know, Abel is sons of, and they're going to go down these rabbit holes uh, that they made up, maybe, because it was brought up years, you know, over a thousand years ago, because Christianity sounded weird, right? And people didn't want this to be, but if you go back to all the old, all the old textbooks, or the old scriptures, and the old writings of the past, all the people of the Bible believe this to be the sons of God, and it makes so much more sense when you accept that. It's going to make a lot of sense, and we're going to learn more about what they actually believed. So the sons of God fell in love with human women. I call this the first alien invasion, right? That's why the flood actually happened. And they came down, remember, angels can't procreate, right? But they can take on different bodies. They're polymorphic. They can take on different shapes and forms. So I'd imagine they came down and looked like human men. Probably tricked the women. I'm not sure if they immediately knew or not. I don't know the details of it, but I can imagine they looked just like men. Um, and this was, they had children, which were called the Nephilim, right? So you have the sons of God, you have the human women together. They make the Nephilim, we'll get into that. But this was a rebellion against God's way. So remember, God said, be fruitful and multiply to Adam and Eve. And then he did it, uh, so he did it to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. And that was supposed to be for humans, but they kind of jumped into the mix here. And this is one of Satan's strategies, which I didn't have time to go over last week, but Satan has different strategies to attack God's plan. As he learns God's plan, he starts to attack specifically, Right? Um, so he's, that's why he attacked Abraham's family and kept getting closer and David and all, all that because he knows God's plan as it's revealed. Um, but this was a rebellion against God's plan to basically say, you know, God could save humanity and the evil spirits or none at all is what they were trying to do. If they would have mixed long enough, there would have been an ungodly bloodline throughout the whole earth. And that's what this was, rebellions of spirits and humans, but led by spirits. Now, these are the fallen angels. Or should I say some of them? The Watchers are fallen angels. That's what they are. The Nephilim are not fallen angels, and we'll get to talk about what they are. Um, but fallen angels are actually identic identical to the holy angels as far as traits and characteristics go. They're just oppose God rather than serve God, right? 
So it's just you know it's just like us. We're all humans, right? We could you could be doing good things or bad things. Some of the angels, uh, you know, wor- worship most of them worship Yahweh and work for Him, deliver His messages, do those things. But then there's these evil ones, perhaps a third, perhaps a third of them, um, who f- who are satanic, right? And they have the same they have the same abilities as angels because they're the same kind of beings. Uh, the type they are well, first off they had a beginning, so they were created to all these even the gods we'll get to talk about were all created beings by Yahweh, the one and true God. And they're immortal, so they don't die, which means all these beings are still around that we're reading about. They're still around today. Okay, they're still around. These ones, um, the ones that from the the Watchers are, you'll see where they're at. We're going to go over in a slide here. They're not necessarily roaming around here. Um, titles for these beings, obviously, angels, sons of God, like we just read. You'll sometimes see them called heavenly host, the stars. At times, like I said, they're going to be called demons, but these are not demons. Fallen angels are not actual demons, according to the ancient people, which we're going to get to here. All right, the imprisonment of the Watchers. So these Watchers are specifically the ones from Genesis 6 that we're talking about. Not all the angels came down, right? Not all of them. There was only a select number of the sons of God. And they were punished, thrown in a place called Tartarus. Turn to 2 Peter 2.4. We're in the back of the New Testament, so near the back of your Bibles. 2 Peter 2, verse 4. All right. Now, it says it's going to talk about Tartarus. Sometimes Tartarus is translated as hell, but I can guarantee you hell is not what it's referring to here like you think of it. This is Tartarus. This is a holding prison for spiritual beings we're going to read about, okay? Um, all right, verse 4. Uh, 2 Peter 2, verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into Tartarus, or hell, and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. Then he says, if he, if he did not spare the ancient world, it continues on. So he talks about angels there sitting, being cast into Tartarus or hell, committing the chains of gloomy darkness. Now go to Jude. And don't ask me what chapter, just go to Jude. <laughs> it's a little Bible joke for everybody. <laughs> All right, go to Jude 6, verse 6. And listen to this one. This sounds a lot like what Peter just said. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. So Jude and Peter say the same thing about these spirits that sin. The only um, real details that we have of ones that have seemed to have sinned and commit some kind of sin is here in Genesis 6. Now, they all sin by rebelling against God. But what, what the ancient people believed is what, what Peter and Jude are talking about, because they all believe this, they just said this stuff, and people know who they were talking about. Today, I have to explain to you who these angels who sin were, because nobody knows it anymore. Nobody talks about this stuff anymore. But they were changed. Now, there's other references. Um, just go to Revelation 9. So we got Luke 8, 30 and 31, but go to Revelation 9. and in, We're right, right after Jude there, so we should be in the neighborhood. Revelation 9, 3 to 11. 3 through 11. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those who people did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were allowed to torment them for five months and not kill them. And it's talking about all these beings, right? But if you go back to uh, verse 2, sorry, I put verse 3. Verse 2 says, it's talking about the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air was darkened with the smoke of the shaft. And then from the smoke came locusts. These locusts, this term locust here, is referred to demonic. It's another term for demonic beings. It says Revelation's full of symbolism. And it talks about here that Apollyon or Abaddon, which last week you should know, that is Satan. He goes and releases them from the bottomless pit, like they're locked up here. Now, we don't know if they're the exact same ones here as the Watchers. Very much likely could be. Or if there's some other beings that are also locked up. Because if you do go back, let's just go back to Luke 8. I know we don't have a ton of time with all my slides, but Luke 8, verse 30 and 31. Here's why I say this. Luke 8, verses 30 and 31. Here we go. All right, so this is a story, just to just give you guys an idea, of legion. Remember in Jesus and the legion of demons that are inside the man that he goes and casts out? So verse 30 and 31 says, Jesus then asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered me. Look what the next verse says. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. 
So they knew about, and, and the abyss, by the way, it's the same terminology of Revelation that Satan gets the key to and unlocks and opens up. And they come flying out on the earth and it's hell on earth. Why? Because they're, just think about this. Imagine right now if we just said, you know, right now, is the world in turmoil now? Yeah. Is there crime and evil now? Oh, yeah, there definitely is. What happened? What would happen, though, if I just said, you know what, let's unleash everybody from all prisons, all penitentiaries, unlock the doors, let everybody out. You guys would all be in a panic, wouldn't you? Why? Because the worst of the worst have now been let out. Sure, there's people out here that are bad, but these people are known to have done some heinous crimes, right? And now they're out. Same thing here. These beings are probably so heinous, they're going to wreak so much havoc that the Lord locked them up until the end, right? And then they get unlocked, and then they'll, get, they'll eventually all get dealt with. But we have references here. And the chains of gloomy darkness were used by both Jude and Peter, both. That's not one reference. That's two. I don't know exactly what that means completely. I can't tell you what it looks like in the abyss and where the chains are. I don't know how literal or figurative it is, but I can tell you there's, they're in prison somewhere. And they, did, and they all know about it, and they didn't want to go there. That's why Legion asked not to go there, because they knew about this. So some interesting stuff, and these, this is all strange unless you know the sins of Genesis 6. Then you know the beings they're at least talking about here. All right, now the fallen angels, this is going to segue into demons too. This is the weird phenomenon I talked about. So spirits, if they can become humans and procreate with women, they can, uh, I mean, even Jesus himself was able to shape shift and look like a gardener and then, his, and then rode to Emmaus. They didn't know what he looked like. And in the Old Testament, he was showing up as different beings, right? They could do that too. Now, in the past, in other cultures, there's always been talks about aliens or what a lot of them people call sky gods or sky people, right? Um, and it's been around forever in cultures. Even including today, people still see this stuff. I have an ancient picture. That's an ancient one uh, there of a UFO from apparently the China. We have uh, the 1940s ones here. And, of course, ghosts, Bigfoot, all the weird stuff. I'm going to bundle it all in today. Poltergeist, all this weird stuff you hear about, these things that people can't explain. Um, I believe are fallen angels and demons because they are here to deceive. They're here to trick people. They're here to distract people from the truth, right? And that's what a lot of this stuff does. A lot of people, uh, you know, say this stuff can't be explained or they believe all these weird things. They're not green Martian men, but they love to convince people that they're out there in outer space messing with us, right? They love to convince people of all these kinds of things to discredit it because the first thing you'll hear when somebody says there's angels means that the Bible can't be true, which is ironic to me. But that's what they'll usually say. Well, the Bible can't be true if there's aliens out there. Well, there aren't aliens out there like they're telling you, but there's beings that are manipulating you to think these things. Uh, so I believe when you, and they're polymorphic, that worm again, polymorphic, poly meaning many, morphic meaning forms. They can take many different forms, shapes, and sizes. Um, the good ones will not do this to you. Remember in Hebrews 13 too, the good angels will be incognito like a human. That's why you're supposed to entertain strangers and be, because unaware you can be entertaining angels, right? Uh, these ones love to manipulate and trick people. So this is where some of those weird phenomena I was talking about. When you understand spirits can take any kind of form, it makes sense. Like, you know what I mean? Imagine the kind of tricks I would play if I could do that, by the way. I'm a prankster, and it would be terrible if God let me take on different forms because I'd do all kinds of crazy things, right? So imagine what they're doing when they're actually trying to stop you from getting the gospel. Okay, now here are the Nephilim. Now we've got to talk about this. The fallen angels and the human have children. They're the Nephilim. What are the Nephilim? They're these giants. They're the hybrids. They're the ones the Greeks talked about. The demigods. Half God, half human. That's literally what they were. Because remember, God is a general term, not a name. And all spiritual beings are quote-unquote gods. And even the Bible will talk, we'll get to quote-unquote gods that have higher power than some other spirits, but not as high as God. Anyway, I think Hercules, Atlas, the titans that were talked about have somewhat of a reality to them. That's what I'm telling you. That this is that the Bible said they existed too. We just call them by different names. But the reason it's important to understand this because you won't understand demons unless you do. So here is the problem: there's all these evil giants, right? All this evil going on. First, Enoch writes about this. It's not in the Bible by any means, but it's basically a deep dive into Genesis six. If you ever want to read it, basically what was going on? The people believe there's these giants. You know, some say they were 30 feet tall. Who knows? Um, but there's these giants on the earth. Everything was evil. People think sin was so bad on the earth. I think God would have sent a flood by now if that were the case. We'd get flooded too. The difference was here, this evil bloodline, and God had to exterminate them, sent the flood. This is why the flood was sent. This is why the flood happened. People said to wipe it clean, start back with humanity. Noah was perfectly human with all of his family. And because of that, they all died, and they became demons. This is the origin of demons, by the way. This is what people don't know. The ancient times, angels and demons were very different. When the flood killed the Nephilim, the demons emerged out of this. They were now uh, a, a thing. They did not exist before Noah's time. There were no such thing as demons because the Nephilim didn't. Well, the Nephilim were around, but the, they didn't exist until the Nephilim died. 
Demons are the disembodied spirits, the ancient people said, of the Nephilim. Because when they died, they could not return to the spiritual realm because they weren't really from there. Only their parents were. And they couldn't go to Sheol with the humans because they weren't human. Their human parents were. So they were stuck in the middle, kind of, right? They're stuck in the middle here. And that's why they're still around today without bodies. why they're always trying to possess people. They're naked. They're cold, naked, and afraid, you could say, right? And so now I'm going to get this question. Though People always say, well, yeah, what about that one other... What about the, you know, if, if a Goliath, he's from the Anarchy, he's from the giants, how did he come around if he's after the flood? Well, look what that verse said. I highlighted in yellow from Genesis 6. It says, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward, okay? So it's like, okay, so he wiped out the flood. It seems to have taken care of the bigger picture. It doesn't seem to have happened at such of a big scale, but nowhere in the Bible does it say they couldn't do that again. And I even make the allusion to when Paul says women cover because the angels are watching, I think it has a reference to this kind of thing. And that, you know, as in the days of Noah, in the end, these kind of things could happen again, is what I'm saying. Um, and there's some weird secular people that will say it's already happening, and they don't even know what they're saying. They'll talk about these alien hybrid programs. It's crazy. But it actually sounds very biblical. But afterwards, they're definitely around because uh, I took a picture of this. This is when they go to spy the land. Uh, when they go to spy the land, they find these giant great clusters. They see all these giants they can't defeat. That's some remnants. We don't know how, whether the angels came down and started doing it again or what it was. But they definitely uh, continued on. Um, and that's what the Canaanite conquest is about. Joshua was here to wipe out all the Nephilim groups that somehow started to pop up again. That's what the flood did. And now Joshua was sent into Canaan. Because here's the thing. God promised Abraham that he was going to have Canaan, right? And, that, and then for, for 400 years, Abraham's family was in Egypt. That gave 400 years for Satan to lay landmines, basically. So the Nephilim were in there populating Canaan. And that's why God says, when you go back, wipe them all out. If you look at every single one of those groups, they all had Anakim, Zamzamim, or Rephaim, or Anak, like all those beings. And those are all giants, by the way. Anakim, Zamzamim, Rephaim, on top of the Nephilim. They're all these giant races, right? And so that's what was going on there. Uh, if you wonder why it sounds so brutal in Canaan, it was really this spiritual war. Because remember, everything here is a physical fruit of what's going on behind. Like, you know when your apple tree's alive, but there's not apples on it? But you know the stuff's still going on, the code's still running. And then you see apples, you're like, oh, apple trees are here. It's like, well, no, that apple tree's been living and doing things the whole time. You're just now seeing fruit from it. That's the same, that's the same here. The war's been going on. This is what it's all really about. And then now we gotta get to the gods and their story. So the Tower of Babel's reversed from Genesis 6. Genesis 6 was spirits convincing humans to sin. This one was human sinning and spirits getting involved in it based on what God did. So this is the Tower of Babel, Third Rebellion, and this is where God disinherits the 70 nations. If you do not understand the story as the ancient people knew this, you're going to be so lost when this talking about the nations and re-inheriting the nations and you know, all this stuff. Um, so this is where, obviously, the people tried to build that tower. They're trying to be like God. God said, no way. He's, he comes down. Isn't that interesting? He comes down and confuses them and turns them into 70 different nations. This is where the Table of Nations, Genesis 10, talks about all the beginning of all the 70 nations. Egypt's even in there, by the way. Um, so it shows how they all started, and languages get confused. This is where the nations started, but then they each got their own gods, quote-unquote gods. Uh, some of the highest spiritual beings there are that are not God. And they're not, they're not uh, Satan either, because they're under Satan. But these gods are territorial, and they took control. Now look at Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 and 9 here. I have them. This is what, you, you can't just stop at Genesis 10 and 11 um, to get the full story here. This is referring to the Tower of Babel. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he, that's that Babel, he fixed the borders of the people according to the numbers of the sons of God. That's the exact same terminology in Genesis 6 for those spiritual beings. But the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is a lot of inheritance. That's Israel, right? Jacob is Israel. They've been saying, my nation's Israel. All the other ones are the sons, sons of God are ruling, the evil spirits, right? <clears throat> Remember the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. God did not waste his breath with a fairy tale one to open up, right? Can you imagine the first thing you told your kid and you told him something that they didn't have to worry about? No, you tell one of the most important things to worry about. And God says, one well, of the most important things I want you to know is don't worship any of these other gods of the nations that are over the 70 nations, um, and I'm the one true God. And that's because they were high-ranking territorial spirit beings. Meaning, if it was the god of Egypt, that spirit would have been in charge of Egypt. And there might have been different layers. And then there were some, and they were kind of divided out. Just like we have governors. Think of it as a governor or a president or something like that today over their region. Once you leave America, our governors and presidents don't really have a lot of authority anymore, right? But once you're in here, then we do. Once you go to Canada, now it's a new set of group, right? Same thing with the spirits. It's cosmic. 
It's a cosmic war. There's cosmic geography, we call it. And they are cosmic governors, essentially. They're each over a specific region, even to this day. And if you notice, Michael, remember what he's called? The Prince of Israel. Prince is another term for these gods. So it shows you that Michael is actually one of these high-ranking beings, but he works for Yahweh. Just like these other, these other gods work for Satan, Michael works for Yahweh. So we know who Israel's quote-unquote territorial being is. That's Michael, that Yahweh put him over. But there's other ones over the Gentiles. That's why Michael's always fighting them, because it's his war to fight, because he's one of them. He's fighting for his territory of Israel. And Michael would actually still be there today, over there fighting in all that chaos. And that's what we're seeing today, chaos from those wars, right? Um, so if you go to Daniel 10, actually we don't have time, right? But write this down, Daniel 10, verses 8 through 21. I'll just recap it. Remember Daniel gets like this message from an angel, and it took like three weeks for it to get there. And he says, you fasted and you've been praying. Since I, you started praying, I tried to get here, you know, does that whole thing. But then if you notice, Michael uh, is going to have to fight against it. talks about the prince of Persia, which makes sense because, you know, Persia was right there going, going through this whole thing, the, the Persian prince, which was a spiritual being. He said, after that, I'm going to fight the prince of Grecia or the prince of Greece. Now, the interesting thing, when Daniel was written, Greece hadn't come yet, right? Greece conquers Persia later on. So you can already see what was happening. The war, what Greece took over, that had started hundreds of years earlier in the spiritual war here. And what was happening was Michael fighting the gods of the nations here. That's what was going on here. So that's what it means by prince. It didn't mean Cyrus the Great when it said the prince of Persia. It's clearly a spiritual war. It's whatever being was over Cyrus at that moment. Psalm 82, 1 and 2, I'll just go ahead and read this just to confirm what I'm talking about, the gods. God has taken his place in the divine council, like I mentioned earlier, in the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. God would not make this up if it weren't true, and we'll put it in the Bible. He's in the midst of the gods. These are not equals to him. These, you know, are, they're subject to him. And he says, how long will you judge unjustly? He's talking to the Gentile nations who still today run their nations with evil and wickedness and don't take care of the poor, he goes on to say. And then in verses 6 through 8 of Psalm 82, says, I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men you shall die, so, and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, O judge. And look what it says, for you shall inherit all the nations. If you don't understand this story, you're not going to understand what inherit all the nations mean. The reason that we're going out and spreading the gospel to all the nations is to reverse Babel, by the way. It's because they've been misled. They all knew about Yahweh at one point, and now what I say, they're in a generational slumber, so to speak. Some of us... Uh, most of us, we're not Jewish. We were all from a Gentile nation. And then one of our people woke up. God allowed them to understand that Yahweh was the one true God, and we got on the right path. There are some today, if they're untouched tribes, that have never returned since the Tower of Babel. And that's why Jesus is saying, go to the ends of the earth. we got to re-inherit. i got to take all my people back. That's what the whole story is about. And that's what I'm here to say. This is the whole story again. Yahweh versus Satan and the gods for his people. These spirits still rule the nations today. They don't die. And I like to say, think of Haman and Hitler. So Haman, in the story of Esther, remember what he wanted to do? He hated Mordecai, but he really hated the Jews, and he wanted to kill the Jews, right? He wanted to kill the Jews, and it didn't work. Remember what Hitler did in the 1940s, more, very more recent than Haman? What did he want to do? He wanted to kill the Jews, wipe out the Jews. Why would anybody want to kill the Jews or wipe out the Jews? Well, if they got the idea, it would probably be for one of these spiritual beings that are at war. And they know one of God's promises to save the Jewish people in the end. So if they can wipe them out, they're still at war, still trying to do that. So the gods in Yahweh still battle today. Again, look over the Middle East. That's why it'll never be solved. They try to do Middle East peace. It'll never be solved unless you solve it on the spiritual realm. But we only know there's only one way for that to be solved. We all know what it is. Um, but Satan, um, again, is over, the, over these beings, but I'm not sure how much they listen to him. Um, and God, the whole reason he started his own nation was to save humanity. That's why Abraham was called. To reverse this stuff because abraham was actually a gentile himself terah his his father actually worshiped other gods it even says that in the bible he had teraphim and everything and that's the whole plot there so i kind of already talked about it's reversing babel that's the whole idea there now let's go into the characteristics now you have the understanding of the spiritual warfare and what the difference between the gods are the fallen angels and the demons now let's look at some of the things here. So we know that they are aware of Jesus' identity. In Mark 1.24, we see that. They're aware of their own destiny in Mark, Matthew 8. We even know they're going to get They know they're going to get sent. They always say, you know, please, not now. And Jesus, no, he says it's not their time yet. Um, we also know they're localized and can only be in one place based on Matthew 8, 28, 34, and Acts 16, 16. And that's a really big one. So if there's a demon that's causing you problems, cannot be causing me problems. If Satan is causing you problems, definitely can't be causing me problems either. They are only in one place, right? However, it feels like they're in many places because there's thousands of them. There's myriads. 
Might even be more. There might even be millions of them. I don't know. Myriads upon myriads, the Bible says. But they can only be in one place. There's only one being that can be everywhere at once, and that is God himself, Yahweh, right? He can be everywhere at once, but they're localized. We also know um, from 1 Timothy 4.1, they can push false teaching. You've heard the term doctrine of demons, right? So this is essentially, we know that the spirits encourage false teaching, right? That's why I say the spirits are very active in the church in America today, because they slip in and they give these ideas for the preachers to talk about prosperity or that you can do it all yourself and all these kind of things. That's doctrines of demons, right? So we know that one of their tactics will be to tell you lies. And don't forget, based on Satan, that he was re reciting scripture to the Lord, to Jesus in his temptation. And he was trying to manipulate. Remember, he's like, oh, hey, it'll say you'll be protected. And Jesus basically says, oh, you use that out of context. I'm not supposed to test, and that's out of context. I'm not supposed to be doing that, right? So it shows right there, Satan was twisting the scripture. So I guarantee you, the demons do it. And I guarantee you, this is what Paul's talking about when he talks about doctrines of demons. We also know that they're very strong. They can add supernatural strength, right? We saw that probably even in the giants of Genesis 6. The reason they're so mighty, because they had that strength from their parents, from their quote-unquote fathers. Uh, but the man possessed by the, uh, Garrus, the garrison in Mark 5, you see, remember, they couldn't even chain him up. The people couldn't restrain him. Why? Because he had supernatural power. It wasn't him. There was another being in him that had greater strength than he did, which is ironic because that's like we are, right? We could, we could be unbound by God's power. God's power can work through us. It's greater than we are. We're strong spiritually because we have God's power within us, right? The garrison had demonic power, and he was physically strong in that way. So we know they have power. We also know they attempt to kill. Remember in Mark 922, they try to get that boy to like commit suicide, throw him in the fire and kill him. So we do know that the demons can try to kill people, right? And there's a terminology, like sometimes people who like commit suicide, I know somebody said, well, they got, the demons got, their demons got to them. And I know it's a metaphor, but sometimes it, it makes you wonder, is it true? The amount of things they make you think, they can make you, they can send you thoughts, send ideas. That's why I make sure not to, make sure to take every thought captive, because if it's not from the Lord, it could be sinful, especially whether it's from your flesh or one of these spirits, right? Um, they, can, they can do all kinds of stuff. We also know they can impair the speech, right? In Matthew 9, 32, we see that. So they can make you stronger. They can impair. They really get control of the body, right? They get control of you, um, and they have all these abilities. They can also keep people in slavery. In Matthew 15, we see uh, the, they try to keep the girl in slavery, so they keep, they keep these people uh, doing what they want to do. But we do know from John 10, 21, uh, thank the Lord, they're limited in power, and it does say they can't do what God can do. So although they sound scary and powerful, they are not as strong as God. God is more powerful, and that's good news for you because you're a Christian, which means you have the power of God within you, um, which is, means they're less of a threat. They can still mess with you, but they are less of a threat to you than they are uh, to non-believers. Activities of evil spirits. Let's go to Luke 13 here. Luke 13, verse 11. Luke 13, verse 11. Right. Here's what it says. Luke 13, verse 11. And behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. It's really interesting there. It, said that, it didn't say the case. She had this really bad illness and she couldn't stand. She had this really bad cancer, or she had this really bad arthritis, or she had this really... No, it said she had a disabling spirit. And the Bible talks about this. We don't talk about this today. And you do have to, by the way, when we start talking about this stuff, you have to be careful and uh, not say everything is demonic, because there is mental health issues. There are real cancers. There are real, actual, physical illnesses that we all know, right? We do know that those are real, and it's, and it's hard. I wouldn't say... It's, it's kind of hard to say. It's like when you say, oh, I wonder if that person's you know, suffering because of their sin or not. Well, don't even try to guess because God, sometimes we suffer because for God, sometimes we suffer because of our sins. Only God knows. Same thing here with the disease. All I know is you can pray over people no matter what who are sick, right? You want to pray over people no matter what, whether it's in their body or not, but I'm telling you, it can be a spirit. It can be demonic. It can be an evil spirit because we just read about it. And it wouldn't be in the Bible if it weren't true. This woman was, um, you know what it say, you bent over, not fully straight for 18 years, right? That's what it says. The woman was bound for 18 years, the spirit... So if, if Christ would have been around or a Christian with the Holy Spirit would have prayed over this woman, she might have been healed, right? Um, but it was a spirit, so no medicine was going to fix that. We also know in Job 2, verse 7, uh, where Job is stricken with sores. Remember what Satan asked to do that. Satan was the one that was able to do that, right? God didn't give him the sores, and it didn't just say Job over time it developed sores. It was right after Satan says, can I go mess with him? And God says, yeah, just don't kill him. Next thing you know, he's got sores on his body. How? Because they can inflict disease and sickness and illness. 
It's in there. We have, we have evidence of this. Again, not always. If you're thrown up, doesn't mean that you have a demon, right? Um, and especially because uh, you're, you're, you're saved of the Lord, and hopefully it'll be protecting you from that stuff. Um, but just say, just think about it. And they can also influence the mind. I kind of hinted at this uh, earlier. Uh, Genesis 3, obviously, they can pervert the truth and cause doubt. That's the original sin of Satan for getting humans to do, is doubt God. Did God really say that, right? He still does, and the Satan still does this today, and so do his evil spirits, right? And you hear it when you turn on the news, or you turn on your TV, you'll even say, can you really trust the Bible? I mean, that old fairy tale book, I don't know why we're still following it. That's the same spirits. Those are the same spirits talking through new people. These words and ideas aren't new. They're, they're uh, given by spirits to recite this. So when you hear all this stuff, and when you see mockery of the Bible throughout the world and their events, it's very designed. Because no other, if you notice, there's not really any, many other religions. Have you noticed this? Not many other religions in the world get mocked and made fun of today, but there's one. It's Christianity. It's for a reason. Because I don't think the other spirits are worried about messing up Hinduism or Buddhism or Islam, because that's who they work for. That's why I said they are the, they are the gods of the nation. The, the gods of Hinduism and the gods of Taoism, all this stuff, they're quote-unquote real. They just don't have ultimate authority and power. So they're going to try to manipulate and mess you up. And that's why they'll, you know, that's why you'll see people like, I just want to go into a more peaceful religion like Buddhism, because this isn't, and they go into it. It's because some spirit convinced them that the Bible isn't true, and here's how you can do it. Talk them right into their. They gave them a sales pitch, basically. So be careful how your mind can be influenced. Second Corinthians, turn there. Second Corinthians, verse or chapter four, verse four. Yeah, Second Corinthians, four, four. The verse says, In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So it's interesting there. The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. It's actually blinded, like a spiritual blindfold put over them. It means they could see otherwise if they wouldn't be blinded, but they are. Satan blinds them, which means all the other beings that are under him blind people. They're setting them these lies constantly. That's why it's so bad, I tell people, just watch the news and watch TV and soak it in all the time without reading their Bible because you're going to get lied to by the spirits through individuals that you think are just some humans making this stuff up. But I'm telling you, there's a satanic agenda. That's why it's so hard to talk to people about this stuff, because if, especially if they don't believe in the Bible or the spirit world. Because they're, they're saying you're going to read into it, and there's, not, there's no way there's this evil group of people around the world that's trying to orchestrate all this stuff. There's not, they're not smart enough. It's like, well, I know they're not smart enough. The spirits are. They've been at work forever. So they know they influence the mind. Be careful what you're taking in, because they will lie to you, and they'll try to convince you. Uh, they've been doing it since the beginning, because they can lead, even lead believers astray. Go to chapter 11. We're in 2 Corinthians 4. Go to 2 Corinthians 11. And look what it says in verse 3. Paul here, talking to the Corinthian church, verse 3 says, But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. He's talking to believers this time. So before, like, okay, yeah, the, the unbelievers' minds are completely blinded by Satan, right? But here, Paul is worried that they've been deceived by the Spirit. Their minds have been messed with after what he told them. He's writing these letters worried that Satan lied to them and has them going down some false teaching. This whole thing was about Paul and the, and the false apostles, basically, is what this section's about. So you can see, again, they can manipulate. They can get into churches. They can affect your mind. It's why when you talk to other Christians who go to churches that have bad theology, they're going to think they're right because they, their minds have been warped by these spirits who got into the church and taught them bad doctrine. They taught doctrines of demons that Paul warns about these exact things. And, and continue on that, their whole thing is to deceive uh, we won't go into all the verses here, but 1 Thessalonians 3, 5, Paul worried that Satan had tricked the church into sin, just like what I talked about here. Ephesians 2, 2, they deceive unbelievers into worldly living, right? That's why they do it. They can talk them right into this worldly living. Matthew 3, 9, remember, uh, in, the, in the sower and the seeds, that's uh, the evil one snatches the word from believers when they hear it. That's some things against the mind, making sure they don't actually receive the word. Revelation 16, they will deceive nations into rallying against God and the Messiah. Think about that. That's actually one of the craziest things of all, that in the kingdom, when Jesus will actually be there on earth, show that evil's been defeated, they'll convince still, you know, they convince people to rise up at the end and, and, and fight back. They're very deceptive. And then demon possession, I only have a little bit of time to get in this, but I should, uh, there was a great outbreak during Christ's ministry on earth. We don't see demon possession as much before, but you can see all these Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I put the examples there. The early church leaders attested this being fact. This is not hocus pocus. There really were demon possessions. There still are today. It can still happen, but again, not everything is demon possession, right? But this happened a lot, of course, in Jesus' time. 
People will say, well, what about, how come it didn't really happen in the Old Testament? We have evidence that it actually did, but there's a different thing. So Matthew 12, 27, let's go to that verse. That is one more I want to go to. So you can read this with me. Matthew 12, verse 27. Matthew 12, 27. And Jesus is saying uh, to the leaders here, And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. So what you can realize here, Jesus is saying there's other people trying to cast out demons. So this is actually already a practice. Jesus is not the first one to do it. Their sons are actually out there trying to cast out demons. The difference was, it was more tempted like rituals and incantations. Very much like what you see some really religious groups in the Christian realm where they go through all these motions and do all these things. It was more ritualistic. When you start doing that, and incantations and rituals aren't really going to cut it. They were probably not always successful, if ever at times. Jesus could cast them out with a simple word. This was what was so crazy to them. They had had demon possessions before, and they'd gone through these rituals and incantations, and their people had a tough time getting them out of there. But Jesus could just walk up with a word and say, get out, and it would work. And that was a sign in Isaiah 53, 4, um, getting rid of our uh, infirmities. It was a reference to this. This is what a sign of his divinity was, that he could come and cast demons out. Nobody could do this before. That's why it's so crazy when he has his people going out, his disciples going out and casting out demons. Because nobody could do this before. It was still a problem. And we read in Matthew 12, 27, they actually tried it. But they were not very successful, right? Um, and the increased demonic activity here was probably a direct counterattack. It probably was not as frequent as it was back in Christ's ministry. But we do know there was demonic activity here. Um, Saul and his demonic torment. Remember David, the whole reason he goes to Saul was to play music because a demon was tormenting him. Uh, whether it was possession or not, we don't know, but you definitely have very similar activity here. So it is not, you know, made up in the New Testament. Uh, that's, and then David shows that music can actually soothe them and chase them away. Think about hymns. Why do we sing hymns and songs of praise? It can actually make spirits flee. That literally happens in 1 Samuel 16. We also have the lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets at the divine council, 1 Kings 22. We don't have time to go there right now, but 1 Kings 22 to 20 to 23. Ahab's tricked by a demon. Ahab died because in the divine council, one of the evil spirits said, God said, how should I kill Ahab? And one of the spirits came up and said, I can go down and lie and go to a prophet and lie to him. He says, God says, that'll work. And that happens. So there was trickery and all this demonic activity going on in the past. It's not new. Also, the witch of Endor, 1 Samuel again. We got Saul in this one too. Remember, spirits were being summed up. That's what summoned up. That's why Saul kicked him out because it was ungodly. God put it in the Bible because it's possible. You can call up spirits. Wouldn't do it. You can conjure up spirits, do seances, all that stuff. It's real, wouldn't mess with it. And it was happening in the Old Testament. So this is not a brand new thing um, because we know Samuel's called up. And actually, a little plug, next Sunday we'll be going over this exact chapter in the Trimmed and Burning Bible Study, if you're watching. And just to end here, the good news, um, they do have judgment. They're conquered by the cross, Colossians 2.15. Uh, they're basically made like spoils of war. Jesus like almost holds them up, like, look what I got. right? That's what Colossians 2.15 kind of reminds me of. And they'll be cast into the lake of fire. Um, but don't forget, it's a spiritual warfare out there. The reason we did angelology wasn't to learn all these cool, fun, interesting, weird facts, although that is cool and fun and interesting and very weird. Um, but it's because you've got to put on the armor of God. I'm here to tell you that you're on a battlefield, and the Bible's been saying that since the beginning. And they've been here, and those gods of the nations and the demons and the fallen angels are still around wreaking havoc on you, your family, your friends, and everybody you see. So be very aware of what goes into your mind. Make sure to pray. Make sure that you have, you're in God's word because look at the only offense we have. You ever notice in the armor of God, the only offense, the sword is the Bible. It's the, it's the Bible and prayer. That's the only, everything else is defensive to stop the attacks of the enemy. The only way we attack is with prayer and reading our Bible. So that's what I'm here to tell you. The whole point of all this in angelology is to understand the spiritual uh, war is very real. All the weird stuff going on, aliens and stuff, may have to do with the manipulation and deception of the people so they fall away from ever wanting to read the gospel. So I just want to make everybody aware of that. Now, the few minutes we have, does anybody have any uh, questions, comments, or things they'd like to add on that? Yeah, Ashley. It may open up a can of worms. That's okay. So if the spirits flee from worship music, mm -hmm. hymns, that, that's a biblical thing? Yeah. And then... So my first part is, where is that? Mm -hmm. And then the second part is, does that mean that music in a different way could be an open door to invite them in? Yes. yes. So so what you're seeing is, so if I go back to 1 Samuel 16, so if you read this chapter, Saul has a demon. And they can't figure out, they say, we know this, this musician. He can come. David comes, plays worship music to the Lord, and the spirit literally left him. 
And that's how Saul and David, Saul didn't know that David was actually anointed at this time. It was just a quote unquote coincidence. So David comes in, starts playing music and it goes away. And then you see throughout scriptures, sing joyful noise to the Lord, sing songs together. Even with Jesus, they would sing hymns. Now, obviously, you have to believe it for it to happen, right? You can't just say, like, in the name of Jesus, and that's why you saw people get attacked and beat up. That happens in the Bible. So the name of Jesus isn't itself enough. You actually have to believe, right? Same thing with music. However, she opens up a good point. Music is very powerful because that's what David used to get rid of that demon, which means they could also maybe enter what she's probably getting at with other music, and I believe so. It's the age old, ever since, like, the time of the Beatles till now, that it was devil music. There really, quote-unquote, is... To an extent, devil music in a way. It's it's the music is not itself evil. This is why I challenge. This is why like I have my own gospel jam in because rock itself isn't evil. It's what the contents are behind it. But unfortunately, a lot of that music, ninety percent tilted towards evil, right? And sometimes it's just generalized, right? Sometimes it's just general. But there can be evil connotations of being rebellious and all those kind of things. And they would have power. And I know I walk around. I know a song. It's it's in like all the VBS songs are still Jesus is the light of the world. It's just going, um, you know, it's still going in my head over and over and over. So that's why it can be helpful or hurtful. Because imagine how many kids are out there listening to demonic stuff. You know what I mean? I used to think it was crazy. Like, oh, shut up. You know, it's just music. I don't listen to the words. I don't listen to the lyrics, right? But it can definitely be demonic. And music is a channel, right? It's the reason that, it's the reason that you're supposed to have it. Like, the Bible's very clear. Like, even in heaven, I always joke, I don't want to be a drummer in heaven. Because there's going to be musicians and cymbals. It's like, I hope I'm in the band. And, but, because there's going to be music, right? He would have got rid of it. It's like, I really hope I made this band. But, um, so, if, if it's so powerful that God will have music there, it must be a powerful tool and channel here. So, yeah, so that would be the evidence for it, is that David actually helped get the demons out with the music. So, and because he believed in it, and it was for the Lord, and they had to flee there. And that was before Jesus, by the way. It's pretty interesting. Any other uh, question or comment? All right. Well, thanks for bearing with me and all that crazy stuff there. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you guys enjoyed uh, Angelology. And this is all on YouTube, so you just go back and refer to it. Or if you didn't see the ancient biblical worldview, that is also on the Stonington Baptist channel. Be sure to check that out. Otherwise, have a great Sunday, everybody.